All right, everybody, so uh, I'm not supposed to talk about the company, so I'm going to talk about the journey getting there. Um, so in terms of doing what you love, it's an interesting topic, and uh, I guess the way I'm going to approach this is really just telling a story from six years ago when I was a freshman in college to now. Um, so when I was thinking about doing what I love, if I can get this working. Hold on. Oh, this was different. Ah, there we go. I got it. <laughs> Good. Okay, cool. So doing what I love. That's, that's an interesting slide to have as the first one. But uh, oddly enough, so when I went to college, I was a freshman at Northwest University. And when I went there, with my background, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, humble background, humble beginnings. And it's funny because my whole life, I thought that having money was the most important thing. Having that wealth, having that comfort, having that lifestyle to give me the comfort and flexibility to be able to do what I want. So when I went to Northwestern, I was like, all right, how do I make the most money? What job do I do to where I can generate all that wealth? And come to find out, banking and consulting were the two key occupations that I could go into to make lots and lots of money. So I was like, all right, cool, I'm running with it. So got really involved in all these investment banking clubs and consulting groups and read all these books and guides and doctored up my resume and did all these amazing things. And um, oddly enough, while I was doing that, I met a couple people who had an idea. And they're like, all right, you're doing all this cool stuff with banking and consulting, Neil, but we have an idea for a startup. What if we put LCD screens in doctor's offices and we educated patients while they wait in the waiting room? I was like, that sounds cool. And they're like, all right, we'll start this company with this while you're pursuing your banking and consulting stuff. I was like, okay. So uh, we raised a quarter million um, and started a company. So it was like my entrepreneurial bat cave in addition to doing the sort of consulting banking pursuit. So sort of what we did. And then after that, I realized that I wanted to really consider the entrepreneurship part a little bit, just a little bit. But I, you know, I'm a freshman in college. I want to make money. You know? I still want to do that, but this was kind of cool. So come sophomore year, I'm doing all these classes, and I'm thinking about all the things I want to do. And I'm like, you know what? This entrepreneurship thing's a little interesting. I'll take another class. So I took another class in entrepreneurship, left the first startup, and then I realized that I had another problem I wanted to solve. I was really pissed off that my haircuts cost so much. So I was like, this is ridiculous. I don't want to pay $20 every two weeks for my haircut. So I'm going to start a barbershop. <laughs> yeah, so I wrote a business plan for a barbershop. Um, and I took the business plan all around the south side of Chicago. I went to every barbershop I could find. I said, hey, I want to do this. I want to make it better. What do you think? And about barbershop number 26, the guy goes, wow, this is awesome. Why don't you take over my shop and let's build out a few more? I was like, okay, so um, I'm still doing my banking and consulting thing, but I open up a barbershop and then uh, operate that on the side. So it's kind of interesting in Northwestern all of a sudden now where I'm doing this entrepreneurial stuff and then still this banking consulting track. Like I was president of the largest business organization at the school and it was awesome and I was working with UBS and Goldman Sachs and BCG and all these other cool companies. They were giving us lots of money and it was awesome. I even got an offer uh, to do investment banking. Um, and I was like, okay. Do I finally want to go forth and pursue this banking thing that I keep purporting I want to do? Or do I want to do something else? So what I realized is that I sort of, I wasn't sure what idea I wanted to do next, but I had heard about this thing called venture capital. And venture capital is essentially organizations that invest in early stage startups and organizations. And I was like, that would be awesome. I would love to do that. Um, so Sand Hill Road is actually where lots of VCs are at in Northern California. I wanted to go there, but I couldn't. But I reached out to a mentor of mine. I said, hey, Troy, he was my uh, entrepreneurship professor. I said, I want to be a VC. I want to work there. What do I need to do? And he goes, all right, um, you're going to need to get your MBA first, probably do some banking or consulting, or operate some large organization be really successful. So I was like, you know what? Nah, that's OK. I'm going to figure this out. I want to do it anyway. So let's bring it on, dude. So what I did was I started, I, I went local. So I was like, all right, where are all the VCs in Chicago? I started doing all this research and homework. And, you know, he was right. Most venture capitalists are MBAs or have a lot of experience or things like that. But um, through a lot of networking, a lot of really interesting interactions, I, uh, believe it or not, got a job at a venture capital firm in Chicago. And it was, in, it was amazing. It was incredible. I was this, you know, junior. I'm 18 years old. And here I am working with startup organizations, helping invest in them. And it was just the most amazing experience I ever had. And it told me something about when people tell me I can't do something. Um, so come you know, senior year, I'm thinking to myself, wow, 
this entrepreneurship thing is awesome. I'm not so sure about the banking consulting thing now. Because when I was at the VC, I'm working with people who have their MBAs. I'm working with people who used to be bankers and consultants. But here I am, this lowly student. I also realized something else, though. Working at a venture capital firm, you need to have a lot of experience. They were right about that. So I decided that I wanted to actually become an entrepreneur again, except this time in the tech space. I was like, I want to be a Web 2.0 entrepreneur. I want to get involved in this so I can better assist those companies I used to work with before. So I reached out to my mentor again. I said, hey, Troy, you know, I want to learn uh, how to do this stuff. I want to start these cool companies. What do I need to do? Rains on my parade again. Sorry, dude, you need to know how to code. <laughs> I'm like, crap, now you're right. I am losing. So I want to learn how to code, but I don't know how. So I graduate, and I do what any normal post-grad would do, which is play lots of video games. Um, no, in all seriousness, I actually did play lots of video games. But the reason I did is because I'm actually passionate about video games and what they can do for education. So when I was looking into that, entrepreneurial mindset kicked in again. I said, you know what? I'm going to move to Seattle, the belly of the beast, where all these awesome video game companies are, Nintendo, Microsoft, Bungie, all that. And I'm going to attack it from within. I'm going to innovate gaming from these large organizations. I'm going to move there. So I packed up all my stuff. Two weeks before I left, I got a phone call from another person. His name's Harper Reed. Um, he will be known as the Harper Troll throughout the rest of this talk. So he calls me up and he goes, hey, he's the CTO of Threadless. He goes, hey, dude, don't leave. There's this cool venture capital firm called Sandbox that lets you do all this startup stuff. I was like, all right, cool. So I take the job with Sandbox. And essentially, my job is an entrepreneur in residence. So I'm supposed to take a budget, come up with awesome startup ideas, hire developers and designers, and build them out in real companies. Pretty much the best job ever. Um, so I did this for a while. And it was really, really cool, really interesting. Did it for about five months. And about month five, I got to a point where I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm doing this management, this business stuff. I'm hiring these developers and designers, but something's missing. I'm not creating the things that I'm having these people do. I have these ideas in my head. I hire these people to create them, but I don't get to do it myself. So I was like, all right, I can't do this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I can't do this. Harper Troll comes back. Hey, you should learn how to do that stuff. You should learn how to build web apps. So I'm like, OK, that's cool. How do I do it? And he's like, all right, read some books on graphic design, read some books on programming, and you'll be fine. So I'm like, all right, let's go. So I crack open the code. I'm like, all right, it's time to do this. And then I look at it, and it's like, what? Like, I, it's like I was in the matrix. I was like, what, what is this stuff? I'm like, oh my god, how am I going to learn how to do this? Um, so I took over a year teaching myself computer programming and graphic design. It was pretty crazy. I'm still doing it. Um, but that sort of leads into some other interesting things. Um, but then I realized that I, I needed some more exposure. I needed to really work in an organization that did software development. So Harper Troll returns. He goes, hey, I have a buddy in Uruguay who has a Ruby on Rails software development shop. You should go there, teach them entrepreneurship. They'll teach you how to code. I'm like, yes, I bought a plane ticket. With the little money I had left, I bought a plane ticket. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. I am going to Uruguay. I'm going to learn how to code. It's going to be awesome. So I had like two months left before I left for Uruguay. So Heart Patrol returns. And he goes, hey, in the meantime, before you go to Uruguay, why don't you start a school to teach people the stuff that you've been teaching yourself for the past year? So I was like, all right, man. It can't be that serious, but let's do it. So I started Code Academy. I can't talk about it that much, but you know, take from it what you will. We were like, all right. Let's share some of this knowledge. Let's create an environment where other people like myself can learn how to do this. I was like, cool. This is awesome. I'm going to go to Uruguay. Harper Patrol returns. Hey, dude. I'm the CTO for Barack Obama's re-election campaign. And we need you to be one of our product developers. We need you to help manage the campaign and lead us to success. So I'm like, oh my god. What am I going to do? I can go to Uruguay. I can start this thing called Code Academy. I can work for Barack Obama and help reelect the leader of the free world. So I start to think about it, and I'm like, you know what? What do I want to do? I'm not sure. There's so many options. I would love to become a full-fledged software developer by going to Uruguay. I would love to start this school to share all the things I've been trying to teach myself and trying to learn. I would love to help reelect the President of the United States. Um, but then I really, really thought about it. And I was like, you know what? I need to do what I'm passionate about. And everything that I've done up to now has been me making a tough choice about what to do. 
So ultimately, I actually chose Code Academy, and I moved forward with that. I sent my you know, decline letter, and I canceled my plane ticket, and I focused on building that organization. Wasn't too happy. No, no, <laughs> just kidding. I mean, he's like, mm, you know. But um, really, though, so what happened was is we decided to do that, and we got over the past summer, we won Startup Weekend, which was really great. We had an opportunity to get angel capital for our idea as well as institutional capital from some of the investors I had worked with before. Um, and then there's also the option of bootstrapping. So when we looked at these different options, right, you, like it's great to have that support and those resources. Um, it would have really helped us out a bit, but we actually decided to completely bootstrap the business. And I'm proud to say that we're bootstrapped, profitable, and proud. Um, next month is when our first class starts, and we have spent zero dollars on anything, and we're now extremely profitable. So it's a, it's a great story. Um, and it may seem like I'm special, right? But the funny thing is that I'm actually not. I'm not special, all right? I'm not special because I had friends there to support me. You guys saw Troy, you saw Harper, but there's a lot of other people involved throughout this past six years to enable this, you know, these opportunities. So the other part in terms of being an entrepreneur is a lot of people think about the what. Like, oh, what's your idea? What's your app? What are you trying to do? But the best entrepreneurs, from what I've learned, don't ask what first, they ask why. Why are you doing what you're doing? What's your purpose? What are you doing it for? The other part of it is competition, right? So you get through the why, you get through the what, you're like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna enter this market. All of a sudden, people get jealous, you get salty. You see somebody else doing what you're doing or some other awesome organization comes out and you're like, oh crap, man. But the funny thing is that if you're an entrepreneur, you don't think about it like competition. If you're crazy, you're thinking about it like collaboration. And the reason you're thinking about it like that is because you're off to solve the same problem. So if you're off to solve the same problem, thank you, competitor, for trying to solve the same problem I'm trying to solve. One of us is gonna do it. This is gonna be great. You'll make, my problem, you'll make the solution to my problem better. So that's another option, right? The other thing is vacations. So the way we perceive life usually is we live for what happens after work. We live for those times when we get the breaks from the nine to five that we work with. Entrepreneurs, it's a little different. We actually, our lives is our work. Our life is our work. So it's like a journey. So even though you do have time off, you do spend time with others, you love and enjoy what you do while you're working just as much as you do outside of it. So one thing that I've done throughout this whole story I've been telling you guys, it's kind of crazy, um, is I take the morning test literally every day. I take this test. And what I do is I wake up and I ask myself, I say, hey, Neil, do you like what you're gonna do today? Are you excited about what you're gonna do today? Are you like giddy? Like, did, did I wanna wake up before I was supposed to wake up to get going on the work I had to do? If the answer is yes, I keep doing it. If the answer is no, I reflect and I try to figure out what I need to do to change it. So I implore you guys to do that. Um, and then finally, one of the most exciting things about entrepreneurship and pursuing what you love is solving problems, right? So think about this. There's a new way to look at life when you're an entrepreneur. When you look at life as an entrepreneur, you see problems and you, like a lot of people are critics. We consume things, we critique things, we look at things as if, ah, oh, that's a problem, I'm gonna go off and you know, go drink my latte. But really, what you can do as an entrepreneur is you can take these problems and you can perceive them as opportunities. All of a sudden, everything wrong with the world, everything that pisses you off, everything that frustrates you, becomes an opportunity for you to create something that solves it, that fixes it. And this isn't just with a startup. This isn't just with you know, somebody that's a bootstrap entrepreneur. This is for people that are working in companies and doing other things, that have families, that have kids. They think of things as opportunities, no longer problems. So I guess, to close out in terms of doing what you love. It's kind of weird because a lot of what I talked about was kind of crazy. It was a lot of pivots, a lot of interesting little anecdotes, but what's funny is that I'm not actually sure whether I'm doing what I love right now. But here's what's important. The important part is committing to finding it, committing to figuring it out, committing to pursuing it, and living that life. So I ask you right now, is you think about when you take the morning test or you think about there's one thing you take away from this talk that I'm giving right now, it's that 
each and every one of us have the capacity to wield that entrepreneurial mindset to pursue what we love. Thank you.